they shut down the factory clearing the fog speaking truth to expose the forces of greed on we act radio 1480 a.m this is margaret flowers and kevin zeese is here as well good to see you again yes and um today we have uh, an important topic to talk about the whole show is going to be devoted to the topic of nuclear energy great and um, we're going to start out with um, Arnie Gunderson. Arnie is a former nuclear industry insider and now an independent consultant and chief engineer with Fairwinds Consulting. Um, he uh, wrote about the recent Diet Commission report about Fukushima um, that he's been saying for almost a year that Fukushima was a man-made disaster and that we face the same sort of risks here in the United States. Welcome to our program, Arnie. Hi, thanks for having me. Happy to have you on with us. We really appreciate it. What is, what is the Diet Commission report? Give us a, just our listeners know what that is. Well, the Diet is the equivalent of the Japanese uh, of the legislature in uh, in Japan, and uh, they had a, a commission of members of the legislature. They're not uh, you know technical PhDs in nuclear. They are uh, you know essentially citizen legislators, mm -hmm. and they uh, they looked at Fukushima to. Um, to determine uh, what what they felt were the real root causes of the accident, I I was over in Tokyo uh, back in February, and got to talk with them for about three hours, and they were uh, uh, just concerned citizens who uh, you know were dedicating a half a year of their lives to try to get to the bottom of it. Wow, that's a pretty interesting uh, approach to looking at problems that we don't seem to copy here. I like that. So what did they find? Um, well, they found that uh, there's an insidious relationship between the um, the owners of the power plants, and there's essentially nine huge utilities in Japan, and the um, and the government. Well, that sounds like the United States. Uh, <laughs> they would like to. Uh, the government of the United States would like to say there's different, but <laughs> but they uh, they basically uh, within Japan, the regulator is reports up through the most powerful ministry in Japan, but it's a, um, a pro-nuclear, pro-energy regulator. Hmm. So they're, they're, whatever attempt they might have made at regulation was being sat on by higher-ups in the chain. So you write that they actually knew ahead of time um, that there were risks, but they downplayed the risks of the Fukushima reactor? Yes. Uh, it's absolutely clear that for the last 20 years at least, um, independent scientists were saying that the, the, the record, you know, if you walk along the beach and you walk inland, they could determine that about every six, seven hundred years a uh, huge tsunami would, would come. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is a tsunami on the order of what hit Fukushima. So the odds of a, of a 14 meter, a 45 foot high tsunami were about once in 700 years. And the Japanese thought that was um, you know, more like a once in a hundred thousand year event. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they, they had plenty of warning. And then um, Tokyo Electric continued to meet with the regulator and pencil the problem away. Now, did they have warning that the plant couldn't handle that kind of a, a wave? Yes, the plant could only handle about a 26 foot wave. Wow. So they knew it could only handle a 26 foot wave. They had scientists saying a, a, a 45 foot wave was likely. And um, they basically sat and convened meetings about it for 20 years and never did anything about it. Mm -hmm. Because the experts weren't in the clique, in, in the, the scientific priesthood, if you will, that, um, uh, that they were listening to. And then um, in the report that you did with uh, Greenpeace, you said that the emergency plans and evacuation plans that they had put into effect were not sufficient um, when the disaster occurred. Yes. You know, Greenpeace pick, picked that out, and uh, the, the, the diet also said that. You know, of any people on the planet, the Japanese have the best emergency plans because wow. earthquakes happen. Mm -hmm. So one would have expected they would have reacted the best. And if that's the best humankind can expect, um, we have serious problems with emergency planning on the American nukes. Yeah, I always thought that one way to kill uh, nukes in the United States was to actually have a fire drill, kind of an a, a, a evacuation drill. Uh, let's let's do an evacuation well, drill for New York City, you know, for the plant that's upriver, uh, you know, and, and see how, how that worked out. <laughs> I think yeah, that, would, that, would, that would end nuclear. Assumptions on emergency planning. You know, for instance, 
they assume that if, if the accident occurs during school, mothers will not hop in their cars and drive to school to get the kids. Mm. But, wow, the opposite. As a are. mother of three, I can say. <laughs> the opposite is true. <laughs> right. Right. They also assume that the traffic lights all work. Oh, great. Mm. And, and all, this, all this kind of stuff. So, um, and that it occurs on a sunny day. And, and uh, you know, they never assume that an act of nature causes the event, which then also disables a lot of the emergency planning. That's not part of the, uh, the drills that we do here in the United States. Right. So that obviously played a major factor in not being able to evacuate adequately. Yeah, there's two pieces. The first piece was they had the prior warning from experts for years. But the second piece was that the government really didn't want to hear the truth. You know, I was on CNN uh, four days after the accident saying this is as bad as Chernobyl. And the Japanese finally admitted it eight weeks later. Right. And in the meantime, you've got women and children that should have been evacuated out and weren't, mm-hmm. um, all because I don't think they really wanted their bosses to, uh, to know how serious the problem really was. Now, I've read some uh, articles, and I don't completely understand them. Maybe you can explain them a bit, about the risk not being over, that there's actually some even b- bigger risks ahead from this, uh, this, this disaster, from this man-made disaster. Uh, yeah, the the um, unit four mm-hmm. is the um, uh, the one furthest on the on the left as you look at them, and all of the fuel was removed from the nuclear reactor, but it's out of the nuclear containment and it's still physically hot. You know, when the chain reaction stops, that doesn't mean the fuel gets cold because there's lots of residual products called daughter products that decay. Well, it takes like five or six years for them finally to get cool enough. Mm-hmm. Now, the building is obviously beat up, um, and if there's another earthquake, uh, it will collapse, and then um, you can have something called a fuel pool fire. Brookhaven National Labs looked at a, Brook, uh, um, a fuel pool fire and determined that you can expect 186,000 cancer fatalities from it. 186,000, and, and what kind of a geographic range? Well, they were looking at a 40-square-mile uh, area would have to be permanently evacuated. Wow. Permanently. Yeah. Now, this one would actually be worse because the, um, there's more fuel in this pool than Brookhaven looked at. But it's, a, it's a, the kind of event that could easily cut Japan in half. Um, if the winds are blowing toward China as opposed to you know, out to sea, uh, it will deposit um, you know, radioactive material um, inland to the, in quantities such that you couldn't use it for use the land for three or four hundred years. And would that kind of a disaster have uh, impact uh, in other, uh, like North America? Um, yes, it really. You know, it, it depends. It depends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you, um, um, if there's a, uh, you need about a Richter seven earthquake. They don't happen every day, right. but we know one happened two years ago, so it's not certainly within the, the realm of, of possibility. Um, if the fuel is um, not cooled, it will burn, and um, it will volatilize and go airborne, um, blow across the Pacific, and at least nail the Cascades. It may not um, it, it, it may not do much beyond the Cascades, but we found from the first accident. So the Cascades meaning the west coast of the United States. Yes, you know anything um, to the west of the mountain range that butts up against the uh, the Pacific. It's like a, a rainforest there, and the, the, mm-hmm. the, the air comes across, hits the rainforest, comes down, and it's pretty clear that Seattle, Portland, and Vancouver got nailed by uh, by radiation back in April of last year from Fukushima. And the same thing would happen, but even more so because there's more radioactivity in this fuel pool at Unit Four. So um, yeah, it's a it's a serious concern, and the only solution is to get the fuel out as fast as possible. And Tokyo Electric has taken their time. And yeah, what do you think is behind that? Money. I don't think Tokyo Electric has the cash, and um, they're basically fighting an accident based on what cash is available, as opposed to fighting the accident based on the fact that human lives are at stake. But it is something that is solvable if the money was put into it. Well, a year ago, I was on um, Chris Martinson's radio show. And he said, uh, what would you do? I said, I'd build a building over the building, 
and remove and use that to remove the fuel as fast as possible. Mm. Just last month, Tokyo Electric came up with a plan. Guess what? Build, <laughs> build, build a building. Build a building over the building. So right. um, I, I had a couple other recommendations that I've been given to the Japanese, and um, one of them was um, uh, categorically rejected. They said, this is a great idea. We don't have the money. But why, you know, if this is something that could affect, um, mm-hmm. obviously, the... Uh, Pacific Ocean, the uh, west coast of the United States. A large part lar- of Japan. A large part of Japan, or go, if the wind blows the other direction, a large part of China. I mean, why isn't there more international support to solve the problem? I would think this would be a priority for the United States. We don't want to see Portland and Seattle and San Francisco, you know, hit with radiation. Well, you're absolutely right. It should be. There's one U.S. senator who happens to come from Oregon who is uh, who is making a similar argument, that this is... Uh, no longer a Japanese problem, but an American problem and a worldwide problem. There's also um, a Japanese ambassador named Akio Matsumura, and um, Akio and I have been working on this for about 14 months. And so at the ambassador level and at the Senate, U.S. Senate level, it's finally getting the attention that it, that it deserves. But still there's no movement, uh, but we are getting finally some attention on it. Has President Obama said anything about this? Um, as I understand it, you know, the, um, the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, is giving um, support and guidance to the uh, Japanese, but they're not making any position, taking any position on what the Japanese should do. It's sort of, it's their country, let them do what they want. But, you know, it, it's not like this radiation stops at the Pacific Ocean. It comes right over. Wow. Um, so I'm hoping we need to take a, a short break, and um, I'm hoping when we come back we can talk a little bit about um, some of the other statements that you made, um, saying that the Diet Commission report may be misused in the United States to um, say that similar accidents can't happen here, and what really are the risks here in the United States. Um, I know the lies You're listening to We Act Radio, Clearing the Fog, Speaking Truth to Expose the Forces of Greed with Margaret Flowers. And Kevin Zeese and our guest, Arnie Gunderson, who's, Gunderson. Gunderson, who's a uh, expert on nuclear energy. And we're t- we started the, the last uh, segment talking about the Fukushima accident and the Diet Commission report. And now we want to turn to the United States a little bit. Yeah, actually, this No Nukes concert we were just talking during the break um, happened the summer after the Three Mile Island accident. And Arnie, you, were, you testified in the hearings on the Three Mile Island uh, yes, I did. I actually uh, had people working on the Three Mile Island site uh, in the 80s, and, and then I uh, became an expert on the, um, uh, during the trial, um, and, um, uh, which occurred in the 90s. Uh, I have to add, though, I, I have a new, uh, another song for you to add to your, your playlist there. Um, Harry Chapin wrote a song called The Rock, and it, uh, it talks about um, uh, you know, someone who, who sees a danger and uh, the rest of the world does not. I, I recommend your listeners listen to it. It's a good one. That sounds like a good one we're talking about. So we want to talk about what the uh, Die Commission report means to uh, the United States. How, how do you uh, see that playing out here? Well, I see the same problems in the United States uh, that, uh, that the Japanese have. You know, we've got a, a, a cloistered group of, uh, of executives who only speak to experts who give them the answers they want. Mm and they then speak to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, and it really is what, um, what, what someone has called for years now um, a nuclear priesthood. You know, unless you're part of the established orthodoxy, um, you, um, uh, you are shunned. Now, that's happened uh, here in the States repeatedly. The most recent one is with Chairman Yasko, uh, who uh, was basically run out of town um, you know, for the last six months. The industry got Congress to hold congressional hearings about his management. Style. What was he? What was he? What was he in short? Tell us about him. He was the chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I was asking Arnie to tell I'm us. I'm sorry. I know you know the answer though. I'm sorry too. I'm kind of an insider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he um, uh, and all he was. There's five commissioners. He was the chair, appointed by President Obama. Uh, he wasn't an anti-nuclear. Well, guy. He was just a regulator trying to regulate. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, on Fukushima, for instance, he insisted that modifications be made to power plants on a expeditious schedule in order to accommodate what we've learned. 
and he encountered resistance from the industry and from the four commissioners other than himself, who um, uh, every commissioner has been personally vetted by NEI, which is the trade organization, Nuclear Energy Institute. Mm, uh, for the last 20 years, the people that are responsible for promoting nuclear have been personally vetting the commissioners who are responsible for regulating them. Mm. So I don't think that's much different than we have in Japan. Uh, no, um, it sounds the same. A former chairman, Peter Bradford, said, uh, you know, there, there are no Democrats and Republicans when it comes to nuclear. He said they've all been co-opted by the industry. Mm. Well, this is not, not only a problem with nuclear energy. It's an issue uh, on many issues that we work on. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, this, this chairman was removed. Uh, yes. Well, he resigned. Um, and he was just replaced um, by uh, by someone named Allison McFarland, who uh, who came from one of the universities in Virginia. So um, uh, she's uh, apparently quite talented, and uh, I, I wish her well. Well, I hope that she uh, shows some independence from the industry. Yeah. You know, that's... on this issue of, of industry independence, there's another leg of this, and, and that's the United Nations. They have a, a group called the... Um, um, IAEA, the United right, sure. Atomic Energy Agency, mm -hmm. um, and they um, act. Part two of their charter says their job is to promote nuclear power. So they um, not regulate to promote nuclear power. Hmm. So they were in Japan for twenty or thirty years, writing glowing reports about the Japanese. Hmm. And if these problems were so evident and so uniquely Japanese. My question is, where was the international you know, watchdog? And in fact, we don't have an international watchdog because of the, uh, the fact that the industry has been co-opted. Mm -hmm. So the Fukushima question. plant was a uh, General Electric uh, design plant, is that yes. right? It was, uh, unit one was entirely built by Americans. Uh, Ibasco was the engineer and General Electric was the uh, reactor. Unit two was... Um, um, Nevasco and GE, but more Japanese were involved, and they wanted to learn how to do it themselves. So when they got to three and four, it was more Japanese and less American. Mm -hmm. But the first reactor to explode was Unit One, and it was all American. So it's hard to, to uh, for the Japanese to point a finger at Japan and say we did it to ourselves. And is the design of those plants uh, one that's been used in the United States? Yes, there's 23 reactors. Um, almost identical to them in the United States. Um, some just north of Washington, one in uh, uh, New Jersey, one right outside of Boston, one here in Vermont, mm -hmm. a bunch just south of uh, Chicago. So um, th there's 23 of these Mark I reactors. And, um, you know, it's interesting. When my wife and I were walking right before the accident, and she said, where's going to be the next accident? And I said, I don't know where, but I know it's going to be in a Mark I design. Why is that? And three month, three weeks later, we had Fukushima. And why? 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 What's the problem with the Mark One design? Well, it was crummy back in the early '70s when they licensed it. There's an NRC memo that um, was FOIAed, and it shows that in 1972 the NRC regretted ever having licensed it. Hmm. But if they took the license back, they were afraid they would kill nuclear power forever. Wouldn't be such and what was the thing. problem with the design? What What were they critical of? It's too small. There's too much power in too small a place. Um, a lot of reactors have enormous containments, and the containment on the Mark I is, uh, is less than 10% the size of all the others. Um, during the accident... Less than 10%? Uh, yeah. Wow, that sounds tiny. Yeah, it's a very tiny containment. During the accident, you know, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was saying, well, yeah, but there's mitigating issues, et cetera. Uh, but during the accident, three days in, a, a a guy named Chuck Castro, who's at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, a real high-level guy, blurts out in a phone call, these Mark Ones are the worst containment in the world. Hmm. So the NRC has known it. I mean, what I was telling my wife is nothing that wasn't known. It's just that they, they can't do anything about it because they're so co-opted by the people they're supposed to be regulating. It doesn't seem like that would be a problem that's not solvable, though. I mean, if, if the idea is just to expand containment, can't they just build additional containment uh, areas for these plants and solve the problem? Well, on the Mark ones, you know, they're 40 years old. Almost all these right. are, are pushing 40, and the NRC just gave them a license for another 20. And the problem is if you put a containment over the containment, it gets so expensive that 
it's cheaper to shut them down. Interesting. Now, the the Yankee nuclear reactor up in Vermont, Vermont Yankee, yeah. uh, Vermont Yankee is uh, is also forty years old. I mean, if they licensed it for forty years, is there a, is there a reason why they picked that time frame? How how is there, reliable is, there, is, is it? Is there a now? lifespan for these things? Yeah. Well, I was um, uh, yeah. And Vermont Yankee is the same design as Fukushima, by the way. Mm-hmm. I you know I started out uh, right out of college in seventy two, the same year Vermont Yankee was uh, got its license, and. Uh, um, the document, when we designed it, we designed them for, to last for 40 years. Now, what they've gone back to over is sharpened their pencils and, um, and said, well, yeah, but the stresses really weren't as bad as we thought. With the new computer codes, we can get another 20 out of them. The problem is that is it's a ratchet that only goes one way. When they've been grandfathered in, there's a grandfather clause within the nuclear law. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, for instance, this Mark I design, um, everybody knows it's a crummy design, but because they approved it in 1970, that issue was not on the table come 2010 when those reactors were reevaluated. You couldn't bring up uh, an issue like that. You could only bring up aging management issues, which talked about you know, would the plant deteriorate any further than it was already designed for. Wow. So these 23 plants uh, that are on the same model, uh, are they built in areas that have uh, like earthquake possibilities or other environmental um, catastrophes that could make us in a Fukushima situation? Well, you know, there's, uh, we don't have... Uh, uh, I can have a tidal wave and... We don't have tsunamis. <laughs> you know, but that's not what took out... Th- th- that's another one of these myths. That's not... The, a tidal wave um, did not flood the diesels. I'm sure that you know everybody's heard that this tidal wave came in and flooded the diesels. What happened is that the pumps along the water that cool the diesels were destroyed. And uh, that can occur from a flood. It doesn't have to be a tidal wave. You know? So they lost the ability to cool the diesels. And in fact, the other little known fact is there were 14 power plants that were affected, not just four. Um, the, Six at Fukushima, Daiichi, uh, four at uh, Daini, three at Anagawa, and one at Tokai. And they had 37 diesels between them. 24 of them failed because the, the pumps that cool them flooded. So this is not something like a tsunami is going to wipe out the diesels. The issue is a flood can take out the cooling pumps that are right along the water. Uh, these Now, um with, with the Fukushima experience, with the Chernobyl experience, uh, Three Mile Island, um, these are coming pretty regularly for such a, the magnitude of the impact of those kinds of uh, events. Uh, what do you think we should be doing? Is nuclear, uh, we, we're very dependent on it as far as the percentage of our electricity goes. Um, what should we be doing to try to uh, deal with this as an energy source? Yeah. Well, nuclear as an energy source only represents 6% of what the United States uses. It uses It's 20% of the electric use, but it's 6% of our total energy mix. Um, you know, my opinion is uh, the price of new nuclear is going to make them not competitive anyway. So we're not going to build any new nuclear plants unless Congress issues loan guarantees. Well, that's, and, a, that's not a very big leap, is it? <laughs> right. So what's Congress doing? Even though they're not competitive in the marketplace, Congress is giving out loan guarantees, which you and I as taxpayers are backing up when these, right. when these plants go belly up. Right. But really, uh, these plants are not competitive, so the new plants are, should not, um, uh, I would expect, not many and hopefully uh, very few will get built. But then you've got 100 old plants. And they're all over 30 years old. You know, all these plants are like me. They, they, they started life in, the, in nuclear in the 70s or early 80s, and they are approaching the end of their 40-year life. Um, uh, we can, if, if we just conserved the way the French do, we wouldn't need these nuclear plants. Mm. If we, you know, we're not talking about going back to be cavemen or something like that. But if we, if we ran our country the way the French do, with lower energy per capita consumption, we wouldn't need our nuclear power plants. So, so we conser- actually, conservation alone, without any other new energy source, is enough for us to break our nuclear addiction. You've got it. 
Wow. And add to that maybe incre- improving the efficiency of the transmission of our power. And well, that, I wonder how many jobs it would create to uh, become more to efficient. To rebuild too. our It would probably, power be, probably be a very positive for the economy in that way as well. Yeah. So you could phase the plants out. You know, I recommend these 23 be shut down immediately, and then you're left with 80. And um, when they hit their 40th year, you know, we had a deal. We had That's a four-year right. deal. And uh, it's time to, to take their hands, say thank you very much, and, um, and give them their watch and let them retire. So we only have a couple minutes left. What I want to get uh, from you in the end here is uh, – what should citizens, this is called We Act Radio, so we like to get people to take action. So what do you think uh, people who are concerned about this uh, should be doing uh, to try to help to end the reliance on this dangerous energy source? I would buttonhole your congressman. Um, you know, there, there's also a couple of really active groups that you could you know, send some money to, Friends of the Earth, um, uh, Natural Resource Defense Council, uh, Fairwinds Associates. <laughs> a disclaimer, but, but, that's your group. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> but the, the real key is in Congress. All roads lead to Congress here. Mm-hmm. Um, if we change the way Congress acts, the regulator will become emboldened to actually regulate, and, um, and, and we'll have safe nuclear plants until they, uh, until they reach the end of their life. But um, unless Congress changes... Um, we're not going to affect that culture of um, uh, the safety culture we really need. And your site is Fairwinds. That's F A I R E winds.com. Yes, fairwinds.org. Dot org. And, and uh, we've and had eight million visitors since Fukushima, and the Huffington Post rated us as the go-to site on Fukushima. So fairwinds.org. If you want to read more about what you're uh, working on and what you're thinking about uh, on this issue. Great. It's the best place to go. Well, we really appreciate your uh, your insights, and uh, we're, this is the first half of a show we're going to do on uh, nuclear. And on the second half, we'll bring on Harvey Wasserman, longtime um, activist fighting nuclear power, to talk more about what his work is now um, to try to end nuclear power. So thank you so much for joining us today, Arnie. We're going to um, go out on this break with another song from the You're listening to Clearing the Fog, Speaking Truth to Expose the Forces of Greed on We Act Radio with Margaret Flowers. Kevin Zeese as well. And for the second half of our show, we're we're pleased to bring on our guest, Harvey Wasserman. He's a journalist, author, a democracy activist, and an advocate for renewable energy. He's been a strategist and organizer in the anti-nuclear movement in the United States for over 30 years. Welcome to our show, Harvey. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Glad to have you with us. So uh, how do you see the uh, the nuclear... Well, first we should fill Harvey in. Oh, go ahead. The first half of our show, we had um, Arnie Gunderson on, and he was talking about the Diet Commission report in Japan and the fact that the Mark I uh, reactors, we have 23 of those here in the U.S., and that they pose a real risk. As well as the overall aging of the nuclear... Uh, plants, plants nationwide. The and, right. Uh, they're nearing right. the end well, of their... Lifespan. Arnie is a great expert, and Arnie uh, Gunderson is an incredible word. People should go to Fairwinds, F-A-I-R-E, W-I-N-D-S, I think it's .org, and, and right. see his beautiful videos. And we post, I, I post many of them at uh, nukefree.org, N-U-K-E-F-R-E-E.org, where, uh, sponsored by Bonnie Ray Jackson, Brown, and Graham Nash, where we post uh, all the breaking news about Fukushima and about renewable energy. Fantastic. Great. So, so uh, Fukushima, as Arnie told you, I'm sure, is it, uh, uh, it's an apocalypse in progress, is what it is, really. Right. That's right. Because we we have this uh, spent fuel pool uh, uh, perched a hundred feet in the air, ready to come crashing down. God forbid if there's a, an earthquake, which everybody believes there will be one. Mm-hmm. And this is an instance now where you know people yelling has had an impact because the Japanese now say they will uh, as quickly as possible within the year, hopefully, get the, those fuel rods down on the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, where they can be controlled. It's going to be a really hard thing to do. I mean, you know, this building is collapsing. How do you build and, and move in um, equipment to, to lower down? Uh, I think it's over 100, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure how many tons it is actually. I think it's close to 100 tons of uh, uh, incredibly radioactive material without mm-hmm. killing everybody working on the project. I mean, wow. you know, a single, a, a single spent fuel rod, uh, if you're within 100 feet, will kill you in, in five or ten minutes. And, and they, they, they there's no technology. This has never been done before. So uh, this is going to be a really real, and, and God forbid if they screw it up and it, the, these fuel rods fall, you know, this is a sort of Damocles holding over, being held over all of humanity because the amount of cesium in, the, in this one spent fuel pool is 
uh, uh, been estimated as being at least 20 times more than was released at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So this is a really big deal. Mm. Uh, all of Japan could be rendered uninhabitable by this. Mm. Amazing, and we face risk of a similar type of situation occurring here in the United States. Um, Harvey, can you tell us what kind of work is going on right now, uh, activist energy, to try to end nuclear energy here in the U.S.? Well, in the U.S., we have a really big fight uh, going on because um, there are four reactors more or less under construction in the United States now, and that's only four. So that, that's, a, that's, in a way, good news because they were talking about this ridiculous nuclear renaissance and all these other ideas that we're going to build many, many more reactors here, and uh, it's just not going to happen. So we have two under construction in South Carolina, and those plants allegedly are being privately funded. I, I have my doubts, frankly. I think they're going to come to the federal government at some point because they just will not going to be able to pull it off. They are soaking the ratepayers of South and North Carolina. Uh, Duke Energy has just merged with Progress Energy, becoming the biggest uh, or one of the biggest nuclear utilities in the country. And um, uh, they, they have tremendous financial problems, let's put it that way, and I'll come back to that. The other um, project is uh, and they're already over uh, $500 million over budget and way behind schedule, even though they just started building about a year ago. It's mm -hmm. mind-boggling. And they, these people will not give us a firm price tag, by the way. When you ask these companies, well, how much are these reactors going to cost, they, they, they say, well, it's proprietary information. We're not going to tell you. <laughs> well, the fact is they don't know. Yeah. You know, can you mm -hmm. imagine walking into a store and you want to buy something? You say, well, um, uh, we, don't, we can't tell you how much it's going to cost, so just bill your credit card. And so where, are these, where, where is this plant? This is at the BC Summer site in South Carolina. Okay. Uh, where, uh, and now the other one, uh, which is looking for federal money, is the Voltel site, V O G T L E. That's in Georgia. And that one um, is uh, two more reactors. There are two reactors already there. They started construction about a year ago. Mm -hmm. They've already had faulty concrete. I mean, if you know, uh, if you use your imagination, if somebody pours faulty concrete at the base of a house, or any kind of big building, imagine the problems that arises. I mean, you, wow. you know, you're, you're, you're doomed from the start. And then they've also showed up with um, um, substandard rebar steel, steel that doesn't meet wow. the uh, specifications laid out in the plans for the plant. Are, the, are, are these, are, are these, co are these cost-cutting things, or what, what's the reason that's happening? Uh, who knows? You know, I mean, it's, it could be corruption. It could be incompetence. It could be, you know, uh, wow. yes, cost-cutting, but... Um, the idea that you're going to cut costs by pouring substandard no, it's concrete. Crazy. It's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> Beyond crazy. And actually, while we're mentioning concrete, you mentioned the older reactors in the United States. Many, if not most of these reactors, uh, 30, 40 years old, the concrete is definitely starting to crumble. Um, and, the, you know, it's just only so long the concrete is going to hold up under any circumstances. When you add in intense heat and radiation, it's going to deteriorate even further. So this is a national crisis. Now, at the Volkel site, and this is, uh, you asked what we can do, and I, we, you've been on my show, and right. we've talked about this, and you've been kind enough to post the petition. We have a petition link posted at nukefree.org because uh, 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 in 2010, uh, Obama gave or um, allocated $8.33 billion in loan guarantees to finish the Volkdal plant. This is the first um, uh, nuclear loan guarantee of a, of a fund of, of $18.5 billion that was set up by George W. Bush, uh, I believe, in 2005. And the Department of Energy has been unable to spend this money because none of the utilities have been um, uh, eager to build a nuclear plant, even with loan guarantees. So the southern companies stepped forward, and they've been trying to use this, get this money. But uh, there's been a dispute. We thought until a couple that uh, money that this was a bit. It turns out that the Office of Management and Budget. Did, are you still there, Harvey? We're we're losing your. Uh, if you're in a bad spot, maybe maybe you have to, if you're on a cell phone, I'm not sure, but we kind of lost your. Um, you here, now you're, now you're back. Now you're back. Here, I'm back? Yeah. Okay, so um, the... You were saying the Office of Management and Budget, but again, we're, we're getting a faulty connection. Let's see if we can uh, make this work a little bit better. Um, still not hearing you very well, Harvey. Uh, how's this? That's good. Okay, so the Office of Management and Budget has come forward and uh, we believe, it's all very secretive, and in fact, uh, a Georgia um, uh, citizen 
Freedom of Information Act to get any information at all negotiations on this $8.33 billion. Yeah. And I, I posted a piece on this at nukefree.org. Uh, the, uh, the interest rate that is being set for this loan guarantee is 1 to 1.5%. One and this is f federal money. Wow. So, uh, you know, if you, can, you can't get a student loan for 1 to 1.5%. 1 you can't buy a house with a loan for 1 to 1.5%. 1 and these guys aren't even being asked to put down a down payment. Pretty amazing. So what, it is what, amazing. So, so we are circulating a petition, which I think you, you circulated on your websites, right. to, um, uh, to stop this loan guarantee from going through. And if we do that, uh, we believe that, or I believe, that there will be no more nuclear plants built in the United States. And I think this will be the end. Is there a cutoff for when this decision is going to be made? Or... Well, we don't know. Uh, uh, they extended it. Uh, you know, they're, they're all being, they're being very vague and secretive about this. Of we, we believe that, you know, well, of course, if Romney comes in, I think Romney is going to push hard to, to give them more money. Um, and, you know, Obama um, got a uh, loan guarantee cylinder company went bankrupt. That was actually a Bush project. Mm -hmm. It's funny because they, all the Republicans have been attacking Obama for a Bush for project, which was, which was a Bush loan, but they're not attacking him for Volcker, which was a, a, an Obama loan. Well, that's because they like nuclear. But, um, that's right. <laughs> I mean, and, and Obama's been a pretty strong cheerleader for nuclear. He's been a cheerleader, but he hasn't done much for nuclear. And, and, and actually, he's, he's been stopping Yucca. I mean, I'm no fan of Barack Obama, believe me. But in all, with all um, uh, fairness, uh, he has not allowed Yucca Mountain, the, the ridiculous repository, although we call it a suppository for nuclear waste, in Nevada to proceed. Now, of course, that's because Harry Reid is the Senate Majority Leader. Um, and, and so uh, he has approved this $8.33 billion loan, but Obama has been pretty aggressive about renewables. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that, um, you know, having followed this, having been active in this issue for 40 years next year, um, we did reach a turning point in 2011. All the major financial journals and all the reports coming in indicate that in 2011, renewables um, crossed over the line with, with uh, nukes and, be, and became very clearly cheaper. So that if you were, God forbid, Donald Trump, and you had $10 billion to invest in energy and you didn't care about anything except making a profit, you would still go with renewables. That's Renewables has, has, has crossed over the, the, the turning point uh, with nuclear. And according to General Electric, you know, that radical left-wing organization, General Electric, they say they will have solar panels cheaper than coal within five years. So the renewable industry, the renewable revolution has really turned the corner. We're, we're beyond the tipping point now, which is a very big deal for those of us who have been fighting nukes. That's gigantic. That's, that's tremendous, and, and that's a good time to segue into our break. Um, we're going to play the song from your group. It's called Solar Solartopia, and your website, solartopia.org, that talks about green steps to a renewable future. The nuclear plants were built in haste With too many risks and no place for waste you're listening to We Act Radio, 1480 AM. This is Clearing the Fog, Speaking Truth to Expose the Forces of Greed with Margaret Flowers. This is Kevin Zeese. We have Harvey Wasserman on, who's a longtime nuclear or anti-nuclear activist. And pro-renewable. And strong renewable advocates. Right, and we were just talking before this break about the fact that renewable energy has passed the tipping point in this country of being... Uh, equal to nuclear. Equal to nuclear. And price. Yeah. And, and hopefully continue to go oh, down. Oh, it's cheap. It's way cheaper now. Yeah, right. well, nuclear is so expensive. There's no, go ahead. There's no, no problem with radioactive waste, of course, with renewables. It creates way more jobs. Right. I mean, my, my little book, uh, Solar Topia, lays out the vision of a totally green-powered Earth. I initially thought of it at 2030, and every time I turn around, there's a new report saying it's getting closer. Earlier. Great. But you ha yeah, well, what you have with renewables, first of all, renewable energy will be a bigger industry than, uh, than the Internet. It, it will be the biggest industry in the history of the world. Yep. We will see in our lifetimes, every, and I, this is not hype, uh, we will see in our lifetimes every car, every building, every machine, every cell phone, um, uh, every parking lot covered with photovoltaic cells. They're plummeting in cost. 
and uh, ri- rising in efficiency very, very rapidly. The exact opposite of the nuclear industry. Mm-hmm. The nuclear industry has had a uh, reverse learning curve. They keep getting worse. That's it's right. amazing. That's right. That's <laughs> ama- get- it's amazing those people that still uh, say that you're know, looking at solar and wind and uh, the other renewable uh, resources that we can't rely on them because wind doesn't always blow and the sun's not always out. And I mean, these people have no imagination. Well, you know, I'll give you two examples of how insane the nuclear industry has actually become. I mean, as I said, I've been, I've been on this industry for 40 years, and it never ceases to amaze me. So the first reactor went online in 1957 in Shippingport, Pennsylvania. You'd think they'd have learned something by now. They went in, and there's a river, the reactor in Crystal River, Florida, and they went in and they spent a billion dollars to, wow. to, to upgrade this thing, and they cracked the containment four times. Oh I mean, God. they will never reopen this thing. They just, it's like taking your car to a mechanic and having them blow the engine. And then the other thing that, that they did, I mean, among the many, and this is a really big fight, I, I believe Crystal River, Florida will never reopen. And the other is, um, there's two reactors at San Onofre in California between L.A. and San Diego. They're right on the ocean and right next to the highway. If you've ever driven between L.A. and San Diego along, along the beach there, that's where it is. And there were three reactors at San Onofre. One's been shut a long time. Last year or two years ago, the owners hired Mitsubishi to come in and upgrade the steam generators, which are a critical part of, uh, of, of any nuclear reactor. And they, they screwed it up. They, they spent... Uh, as much as a billion dollars, uh, well, I'm sorry, as much as a hundred million dollars, and to allegedly make these the steam generator work better, and they they screwed it up so badly that they've had to shut both reactors, and neither of them. Will, it's highly likely neither will op- uh, open again. This is this is you know 50 years of this industry, and they're still doing things like this. It's astounding. So you you asked us to uh, publish an article on our website uh, before this interview. The Exit of Nuclear Based on Consensus and Cash uh, by, by Gunter Pauly. Um, do you want to talk about that? And uh, Well, yes. There are a number of um, issues, uh, but basically the, the fact is, and in, in really everybody who's doing, <coughs> been doing anti-nuclear work uh, for a while has finally, uh, uh, is now jumping on the fact that uh, solar is cheaper and that the tipping point has been reached. And this is, you know, this is a... a shall we say, a, a, a gargantuan his, a historic of impact. It's, you know, in, in the history of technology, it's equivalent of, you know, the invention of the telephone or, or, what, or, or of electric utilities back in the 1880s. The fact that we are now at the, at the transition point. And I, I, it focuses, that article focuses on Germany. Well, let me talk about Germany very quickly. Um, there's been a big anti-nuclear pro-green movement in Germany for many decades. Right. This past, uh, in 2011, they called for a big demonstration, a national demonstration against nuclear power. And in between the time they called for it and the time it occurred, uh, Fukushima happened. Mm-hmm. Nice. And, of course, you know, everything went up by an order of magnitude. And the prime minister of Germany, uh, uh, Angela Merkel, mm-hmm. who's herself a, a chemist, by the way, um, said that she had decided after Fukushima that that was it for nuclear. And, you know, we don't know if that's a political story or if it's truly her her heart that spoke there, but uh, they immediately the Germans immediately shut eight General Electric style reactors mm-hmm. and are phasing out the other eleven in the country. So all nuclear reactors in Japan will be shut by 2022. Now the you know all the pundits said, oh, isn't this political? They're caving. Well, actually, if you look at it closely, Germany uh, is of course a very corporate capitalist society, and I and I'm convinced that what really happened, in addition to the political stuff. And in addition, possibly to Angela Merkel's change of heart, is that the major corporations in Germany sat down and did the numbers right. and say, "Hey, look, you know, we think we can make more money in renewables." And Germany is is into wind to the extent that they've actually run out of good wind sites on on the mainland, and they have to go offshore. Mm-hmm. Germany um, recently, uh, there was a day, I believe it was in May, right. where right. fifty fifty percent of Germany's electricity came from solar. Wow. Now, this is not exactly Florida we're talking about. This is Germany, which is not all that rich in solar resource like, like, like Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California. Mm-hmm. So um, what happened, and Siemens, and this is a big deal, Siemens, of course, one of the biggest corporations in the world, which was at the core of the nuclear power industry, got out of nuclear entirely 
and said, we're done. We're going to do solar and wind, and we're, we, we don't want anything to do with nuclear anymore. And, you know, that is a huge deal. And I will say also that um, the, the similar thing is now happening in France. You know, France is supposedly the poster child of nuclear power. They've got 80% of their electricity from, from nukes. But the new uh, socialist prime minister, Hollande, um, uh, has had a strong, I wouldn't say it's a strong anti-nuclear background, but he's really uh, not been a big fan of the EDF, the National Utility, or Arriva, which is the front co uh, company that builds nuclear. And so he has gone in, and he hasn't formally said it, but they will not be building more nukes in, in France. Wow, that's, and that's I, a gigantic change for France. I mean, uh, yeah. Ger Germany, Germany before Fukushima was already on a path uh, toward really uh, emphasizing renewables. Yes, and this this is what turned it, and uh, Fukushima turned it. I mean, you have to remember that Germany was, and like the rest of Europe, was bathed in radioactive fallout from Chernobyl, mm -hmm. and Europe was really traumatized as well as should be uh, by Chernobyl. And so when Fukushima happened, boy, you know that really knocked it over the line. I will also say very quickly that the the collapse of the French industry, or at least the French um, impetus to build new reactors, has actually probably killed um, the conservative government in England's uh, uh, plans to build nuclear because they're planning and doing it in partnership with the French. And now uh, with Hollande in there, the socialists, they're not going to get funding, and uh, Arriva may not even be interested. So do you see a consensus developing, uh, not just the United States, but around the world, that nuclear's days are, are going to be behind us? Absolutely. But there are two, there are two big question marks now are uh, China and India. Um, uh, after um, Fukushima, the Chinese put, they had 30 reactors uh, proposed, and they put them on hold. You know, China's pretty, pretty close to Fukushima. We don't know exactly what's going to happen in China. There is, you know, we have this vision of China as being a, 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 a shall we say, an ironclad dictatorship, but in fact there are a major grassroots environmental movements all over India, I'm sorry, all over China, China and yeah. we believe that there is a, a strong enough no-nukes no movement in China to make an impact. That will be the final blow if we can stop them in China. Uh, and in India, as you may have covered, there, there is a major, a huge grassroots movement against nuclear power in India. It's a little more accessible to the media and to our information, but um, there is a place called Kudankalam where they're trying to open two reactors, and there is a huge hunger strike going on. More than 300 women have been fasting wow. uh, to prevent this re against this reactor opening. Isn't that something? So, the final, uh, I believe that we have uh, we have all but defeated the movement to build new nukes, new big nukes in, in the United States. And um, as you mentioned, Kevin, you know the question now is shutting the old ones. There are 104. And uh, the industry is holding a really hard line. They don't want to shut any because I think they're aware that if we start shutting one or two here and there, the, the, the dam will break and the, uh, the domino theory will come forward and a lot more of these reactors will go down. You mentioned uh, India and China and the importance of grassroots movements, and I, I want to get your impression of that. You've been involved in this for 40 years. How, you know, how much of this is... Um, if there wasn't the grassroots mo roots movements, wouldn't the economics and risks of nuclear uh, be sufficient? Be sufficient, or do we need? Uh, I mean, how, what's, how important is the grassroots movement? Oh, it's it's global. It's incredibly powerful. We owe a lot to the internet. Uh, people um, in Europe, it's it, you know, Europe is is darn close to having a definitive, you know, turn against nuclear, even throughout the whole continent. There are a couple of countries. Um, that are talking about uh, Czechoslovakia, for example. But uh, the grassroots movement there against nuclear is incredibly strong. Um, and uh, uh, here we have um, a, a good, strong grassroots movement reactor by reactor. I mean, federally, at this point, there's only one thing we can do, which is to shut those, stop the loan guarantees, and then stop the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which we refer to as no real chance or nobody really cares, right. um, you know, from doing all this relicensing. So I would venture to say that every reactor site in this country has a pretty strong, if not very strong, uh, grassroots movement, uh, starting with Vermont, where I'm talking to you from now, actually, where uh, the, the state legislature has voted 26 to 4 to shut the reactor here. Um, and now in Southern California on San Onofre. So some of it is situational. When you have a reactor that's particularly vulnerable like these, 
uh, Indian Point also in New York, a very, very strong grassroots movements which have gone all the way up to the governor. Well, you know, uh, I, hope, I, hope, I hope someday, uh, maybe soon, uh, you can reflect on the importance of the grassroots movement over the last 40 years because there may be a lot of lessons we can learn in the broader uh, struggle uh, anti for social justice, struggle yeah. for social, you know, against corporate power and the mm -hmm. concentrated wealth well, and the whole occupy. There's probably what we can learn from that. Let me put it this way, Kevin and, and Margaret. Um, in, two, in 1974, Richard Nixon said there would be a thousand nuclear plants, nuclear reactors in the United States by the year 2000. Uh, at the time, there were 250 online under construction or on order. Our grassroots anti-nuclear movement just got going pretty much that year, and as of 2000. There were 104, and I would say that the grassroots anti-nuclear movement in the United States was responsible for killing upwards of 900 uh, reactor projects. Can you imagine that's, that? Yeah, that's tremendous. We've, um, we've run out of time, Harvey. Thanks for joining us. So uh -huh. the website you recommend is nukefree.org? Yes, and solartopia.org is mine, and I'll see you in Solartopia as Occupy wins a totally green-powered Earth. We're that's with you on that. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Harvey. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.